do it. All right, guys, we are live on this episode of the Blue Crocus Experience. I am your host, Louis Vandervoek, and I'm joined today by Richard Walsh of uh, Escape the Owner Prison. Um, he has a, a long and storied background, which we're going to dive into here a little bit um, with you guys. But I'm Richard, I'm extremely excited to have you here. We had hopped on your podcast uh, last week, and uh, I wanted to circle back around and hear more about you. So if you can give yourself a quick introduction, and then we'll, we'll dive into it for people. Hey, awesome, Lewis. Thanks. Well, first, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, love what you do, too. So I'm ha happy to share my my story. Uh, yeah, a little, little background on me. So I'm about 30 years in business, a little over 30 years. Started quite a while back. But, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur was kind of always my thing. And uh, I was a custom water feature builder it was my real main business. I grew up in the golf course construction maintenance business. So got into landscaping, things like that, led me into a kind of a uh, a niche of water features back uh, late 80s, early 90s, right after I got out of the Marine Corps. And made that, became one of the best in the country at that, got really good, did steel sculpture, added all that stuff to it. And that kind of blossomed into just a really, you know, uh, tremendous business for me. And then 08, 09 hit, everything kind of crashed, kind of lost everything, had to restart because um, of some dumb decisions I had made, as we all do at one point or another, and uh, kind of reinvent, rebuild. Uh, I have a wife and six kids at the time, all under four years old uh, at that time. So it was kind of kind of nutty. And so I decided like, okay, I'm gonna do some more things, started some other businesses, and that was all good. And I really learned, looking back on my mistakes during that 20 year period of building my other business that uh, that I didn't want to happen again. And kind of my, my goal became, you know what, I really enjoyed instructing and teaching and helping other people. And I said, man, if I can, if I can save some people those headaches, you know, those downfalls and things, that's really where, where, where I really wanted to excel, you know, because I love business. I love people taking risks. I love them getting out there, making things happen, solving problems, you know, being unique. And uh, I just wanted to compress time for them so that they, they don't make those costly mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes going forward. And that's all part of growing and being in business. But there's some biggies that really could set people back, especially in things when things got tight, uh, the economy restricted things start to crunch a bit like they have even 2020 here that if you weren't prepared if you weren't making some of the right decisions along the path those poor decisions that didn't seem to affect you now would kind of take you out in a time like this so my goal became hey how can i help people so i started working with people started coaching consulting and i said i'm going to write a book and i said i, I want to put all this on paper i've always been kind of a writer i like doing that so i wrote escape you growth while loving life so i kind of combine i combine my story my experiences everything i went through and then laid out the the path of creating a uh, business that could you know handle longevity right that can continue to grow and scale without trapping the owner to the business so many times guys get stuck in the day-to-day -day that they can't see to really grow their business you know they're kind of chained to it that was the whole escape the owner prison um, deal so i wanted to show them how to how to scale how to delegate how to eliminate stuff how to how to really give yourself freedom so your business now serves you instead of you serving it i think that's what it really came down to you know everyone wants to be that big hitter and they want to grow a business and but they don't realize once they get in that they they kind of get trapped in there and they never seem to be able to free themselves so that was the the, the gist of the whole book itself wow wow that's I mean, you you just went you just covered thirty years right there. Um, I want to I want to touch on the you just glossed <laughs> over glossed over the fact that you had six kids. That's crazy. That's that's like a whole army there. Yeah, it was six and three years too. So yeah, add that to it. It was kind of I thought I was gonna die in about year four. <laughs> I was I was working like. 14, 16 hours a day, all these kids, my wife's doing everything all day. Then at night, like I'd get up if they needed something, I'd handle that. And I was, I was getting like four hours of sleep a night with every hour interrupted. I was passing out at my desk, you know, in the office and stuff. And I was just, it was crazy. But now I love it. It's all good. Man, that, yeah, that is, that is crazy. I, uh, 
you know, I, I come, I'm looking at it from the different end of the, uh, the history, I guess, because we're, you know, probably a week or two away from having a second kid. And uh, so I'm working to try and escape the owner prison now and, and try and get things in place for my crew and employees and, and team and everyone that's around me and, and kind of helping me bring, uh, you know, Blue Crocus solutions to life. Um, but six kids, that, that's crazy. We'd like to have four. Um, we'll see. You know, we'll see where that goes, but I don't think six is in the cards for us. Yeah, well, never, never count it out, man. Once it gets past four, it's just a number. It's no big. Like last night, you'll have, we'll have 12, 15 kids in the house at a time. You know, I had to buy a 15 person van just so we could take one friend of each kid, you know? So it was, it's just think the, the, the adaptions you make, you know? Yeah, true, true. So um, you, you kind of briefly touched on it as well, uh, that you were in the Marines. Can you speak a bit about that experience and how it's shaped you as a person? Uh, you know, obviously, first of all, thank you for your service uh, and, and putting in the work. But can you can you talk to us about how that shaped you as a as a human and as a business person and, and how those values have carried through? Yeah, you bet. Uh, the Marine Corps is a, well, it's a brotherhood. Okay. I mean, it is different. I mean, we all inner service wise, my brother with my little brothers in the army, my younger brother was in the air force. Um, so we all talk smack to each other, but you know, when it comes down to it, obviously well, from us, we're Americans and that's, you know, that's what it's all about. But the Marine Corps for me, was something I wanted to get into since I was a kid, uh, just something about being the best honor, the, respect everything else with that really really drew me and I was just kind of a combat driven guy you know I mean just something I wanted to wanted to achieve so you know earning that title was a big deal for me so I went in when I was 17 uh, I tried to go when I was 13 that's how goofy I was you know I was a big kid too so I thought I could get by so uh, the recruiter's like how old are you I'm like well I'm 13 all right well, you take these stickers and this book and you just you come back as soon as you graduate high school okay you know <laughs> so I went and uh, but went in and it was it was a tremendous experience you know and one thing I will say that I always joke you know the Marines kind of get it they go it's a lot easier being a Marine after you get out you know so it's, it's kind of cool but it, but when you're in Again, that's 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 where the true bond happens when people suffer together. Okay, that's one thing I learned that suffering is probably one of the greatest things to bond people together. You know, when you and that could be, you know, you struggle on workouts or like in a Marine Corps thing, a combat experience, things like that. Is that's what really draws people and gives you the kind of that lifetime brotherhood thing. You know, one of my best friends probably my only best friend, uh, you know, him and I, we've climbed mountains together, we've worked out, we've done high-end rowing things and competitions and all this stuff. And we're just, we are super tight, you know, I mean, we're just, I mean, it's 25 years, you know, of doing that stuff. So the Marine Corps was like that, right? Everything was an adventure. Everything was, you know, was a challenge. Everything was crappy at the same time, you know? So it was just kind of that experience. Good to get through it. I did learn something from that. Probably the best thing was I don't take direction well. All right. So I, I, I again, I suffered through that part too, you know, being told what to do all the time. I think that was another thing that drove me to be an entrepreneur was I really, yeah, I can take direction for a certain amount of time, but I'm really kind of my own guy and I want to lead. So that's kind of, that's kind of the basis for that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, I mean, that, it, that kind of leads to the next segue is when you, when you got out, you quickly realized, you know, having taken orders in kind of the most extreme sense, I think in the, in the military, uh, you were you were just done with that. Did you start off right away starting your own business, or did you start out with someone else and then transition from that? I got out. Just started working, um, and this I didn't I didn't really care for that because it was so limiting. Like my thing is I don't like limits. I don't like people telling me how much I can make, yeah. when I can work, and here's why where, where I'm odd, right? They never let me make enough and never let me work enough, right? I'm like, I want to work more. Yeah. You don't understand. I'm not complaining about, oh, man, I got to work 10 hours. I want to work more. I want to make more. I know a lot of people will brag like, you know, whether they were union or whatever, I can make, you know, $28 an hour. I can make $32 an hour. And I was like, yeah, but you can't make 33. You can't make 36. They won't let you. Do you understand? And that always drove me crazy. I'm like, someone telling you you're only worth this much? I couldn't deal with that. 
you know, I'm like, man, I can bring so much to the, you know, to what I do and you're not letting me. So that was kind of the, the real, the real driving force behind it. Yeah, that's huge. Um, and I think, you know, some people like the, I'm doing air quotes here, the certainty of, of uh, working for someone else. But the, the flip side is, you know, everyone is, is uh, replaceable. And also, you know, the input versus output is not there. It's not there when you're working for someone else. Whereas when you're working on your own as a business owner, it is 100% what you put into your team and, in, and the work that you put in is what comes out on the other side as far as income and revenue and stuff. So that that's scary to a lot of people, but it's also incredibly uh, empowering when, when you have big goals and want to go far. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, and that's why there's not everyone's an entrepreneur, right? That's why there's a few percent of the population that actually can do this, you know, and be successful at it, you know, because they're not, you have to be a risk taker. And again, it's not like I'm, you know, I'm in Vegas, you know, playing cards or something, you know, I mean, it's calculated risk, but still it's, it's work hard, wait, receive, work hard some more, wait, receive. It's kind of like, that's the cycle that you're in the whole time, you know, lose a little bit, gain some and uh, keep moving forward that way. So that's that's the challenge for most people. I love that. I love that. Cool. So so you get out, you start, you know, you kind of get tired of the, the corporate world, if you will, or working for someone else. And then um, what was it you said golf course maintenance was what you went into after that? Well, I grew up in that business. So my, my dad, a lot of my other family members and stuff were all into golf course construction and maintenance business, designing, things like that. So so I kind of was, I, you know, in high school, I would do landscaping, right? I would mow lawns, I would shovel, I'd dig holes, plant plants, stuff like that. So that was how I kicked it off. Let me just do that because I know I can make money. I can do a service, you know, and again, I was, I was in Arizona at the time when I got out of the core. And, uh, you know, granite's big out there, you know, rocking yards and everything else. And I would literally have 35 tons of granite dropped on the side of the road right of the house. And I would hand shovel the stuff in wheelbarrows and spread it in a day, 100 degrees outside. I'm just a nut, you know, but I loved it. You know, so I'm doing all this stuff, making money and just cranking this stuff out, working super hard. And uh, again, it started to grow. Then from there, I started doing what, like if you've ever been to the zoos and you see all the artificial rock, like the goats climb on and all that stuff, yeah. I started making that. Okay, so I'm like, this is really cool. So I started making these cool rocks because I'm in the desert and rocks are big in the desert because there's nothing else. Yeah. So I started making those and then I'd, I'd weld frames with rebar and lath and do concrete over and everything else. And I kind of really liked the welding aspect of it. So that I started putting water on the rocks. So to make a water feature, I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. Then I went to real rocks and then, then I taught myself how to, you know, weld and do all that stuff. And I became a steel sculptor because there's an artist aspect in me. So I built that and then started doing these incredible, you know, huge sculptures, water feature sculptures and trees and all this wild stuff. I ended up doing some huge projects on that too. You know, um, internationally recognized artist, I guess you can call me. Uh, I've done, done some big permanent exhibits and everything. So yeah, I kind of got into that. I think it was backyard water gardens in the early nineties were getting popular and I jumped on that. That was my niche. And then I just became this, you know, incredible water garden guy, you know, kind of cutting edge front leading the pack with that. And I just took, took that and ran with it. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the artificial rock, I, I was in the Philippines in 2012, spent a month down there at an orphanage, and uh, they're incredible. They are so skilled at making uh, concrete look like rock, like brick, like this and like that. Um, I'd never seen it before. They had palm trees that were like 100% made out of concrete. So I can kind of picture in my mind's eye what you're talking about. But, you know, I can imagine some of those features were, were absolutely incredible for sure. Yeah, I did the entire indoor pool for a guy. They built this giant thing at his house. And I mean, I made waterfalls and stairs and bars, showers, entertainment centers, all out of, all out of this, you know, artificial stone. It was incredible, right? Just amazing. So into the jacuzzis and everything, you know. So yeah, I really, I liked it, but it was super labor intense for me. And I couldn't like, the thing I realized was like, there's no leverage in this, you know, the way I did it and everything else. I said, son, I wasn't really... I liked it. It was really cool. I made it look nice. But when I started working with a real stone, 
then I really got like, this is really cool. So then I kind of transitioned into real stone. I could get things done faster and actually look better. So that was kind of my transition into all that. Cool, cool. So then, so then uh, I, I think you said it, but how long did you do that before kind of transitioning out into, um, into the next thing? Well, I did almost, almost 20 years. You know, I did probably, yeah, almost 20 years. You know, I did all that. And then, uh, and that pretty much when 08, 09 hit, that was about it. You know, I mean, luxury items at that time, if you remember, like no one was spending any money. Yeah. You know, as I, I talk about in my book on November 5th of 2008, the day after the election, this is so timely with our election coming up here, but yeah. my phone started ringing that day. And I had, I think I had over half a million already lined up for the spring. And everyone just bailed. Everyone pulled the plug. No one was going to spend any money. They all just canceled their contracts, everything else. And they're just like, we're out. We can't do it. And uh, I hung up the phone at the end of the day. and like, man, it's over. I looked at my office manager. I'm like, it is over. And she was like, what? I go, I'm, I'm telling you. Like, we'll see what happens. But uh, 09 is not going to be a good year at all. And, and it wasn't. You know, we inched by for a while and then just decided that it's time to shut down. We just couldn't, just couldn't continue. You know, and I think, honestly, looking back, I was a pretty burned out. I built over a thousand water features. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd done all this stuff. So I pretty much had done what I could do. I think um, I had moved into my steel water feature combinations. I did the Garfield Park Conservatory in Chicago, wow. huge permanent exhibit there. Really, really amazing thing. And uh, could have gone that way, but I think I was pretty, I think I was pretty toasted at the end. I really, I really was ready for a change. And again, this is where the book and the whole realization came that, what I did was cool because I'm a hardcore, put my head down, that kind of Marine Corps attitude where I'm just driving forward and getting things done. But I always work twice as hard and twice as much, you know, to get things done because I wouldn't listen to, I wouldn't listen to consultation, right? I wouldn't ask for help. I was going to figure it out on my own the whole time. So the big issue was me just being pretty thick, you know, just being pretty thick headed and figuring it out on my own and no one else could help me because I'm the man. Right. So yeah. really dumb attitude to have. Okay. So who's ever listening? If you think you know everything, well, I got news for you. Okay. You don't. All right. And if, and you can go on and think you do, but you're going to, you're going to waste a lot of years doing stuff that literally an hour conversation with someone could change your life, you know, in the direction you do things, you know, so you got to be willing to accept that help. That's, that's, that was a big takeaway for me. I mean, it took me 20 years. That's how thick I am, right? Yeah. 20 years to figure that out. Yeah, Richard, I, I'm kind of, I went through a range of emotions here. Obviously, the last one was laughing because I think we can all relate to, <laughs> to putting our heads down and just <laughs> doing it the way we've done it because that's the way it's been done. Um, but I was shaking my head and kind of just realizing as you were talking through the 0809 story, um, obviously, you've built this, you know, you're getting to the point of being a little burnt out. So it seemed like that, you know, may have helped you to reach the decision you did. But what, uh, what parallels do you see with 0809 versus, you know, 2020? Because at the time of this recording, it is actually just a couple days away from the election. Um, well, it's tomorrow, actually. Um, but, you know, what parallels have you seen with, with business and everything uh, between now and, and uh, 0809? Well, the, the first one was, and it's, it's very different, actually. It, it's, it's quite different because I think, go back in March of this year, um, the, the governmental shutdown of business, okay? You can't compare that to an economic, you know, collapse. Mm -hmm. You know, this was, this was intentional. All right, I'll just say it. It's just intentional. They, when, when, when the government decides to tell say who's essential who's not essential yeah you got big problems yeah all right and i don't care who's president or whatever but but as a as a country to make that is frightening okay so when this stuff hit i talked about my podcast and things like that too but you really got to look like there is no i did a whole thing on who's essential who's not and it's nobody's not essential yeah right no human being for one is not essential mm -hmm. and to make a classification that someone is and isn't for some health scare, it should be terrifying to every human being. You know, it just you you can't you can't function that way, and the economy can't function that way. We've seen what's happened, right? So, and I looked at things. I just I I have a 
I have good discernment. I'm able to look kind of forward on things and, and repercussions for, for actions. And this has been, it's been tough. It's been tough on a lot of business, especially if you're in the restaurant business. And mm. I, I don't mean, I just, I can hardly even say the word non-essential. It just drives me crazy because it's just not right. Yeah. It's so it's so wrong. I mean, it's it's just like it. I just I'm clenching my fist, just, just yeah. thinking about it. You know. Yeah. No. That that uh, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, my wife and I were talking about the double standards of of the way that different businesses are treated, and it's um, you know it's very different than an economic downturn. And and I kind of like how you painted the picture of you know everyone's essential, and we're all you know we're all working parts of society all working gears in a, in a larger machine right yeah you can't okay uh truck drivers are essential well who makes the tires and the rims and the boxes and the engine and the part everything in that you know that's that's essential to move something what do they take to create that vehicle alone not to mention the places he stops along the way you know so it's like there there's just no such thing you know, it's just, you can't, and it's just, uh, it's just, it's frightening, you know, in that sense. But at the same time, I looked at it from, I drive and there's, there's a big corrugated box factory near me, right? And Pratt Industries are like the biggest in the world for making corrugated boxes. So I see a big sign out there, right? And it says, you know, heroes work here, right? Mm -hmm. So I look at that and I'm like, okay, <laughs> you make cardboard boxes, <laughs> okay? I'm like... You know, heroes work here. And I, I'm like, really? Because it's COVID stuff. And I'm like, you know why they had to put that sign up? This is the crazy thing. And tell me if I'm I'm off base here. They had to put that sign up to literally encourage their people to come to work. It wasn't for, it. Was, they weren't, you know, they weren't bragging to like the average person driving by. That literally was to help get their people to show up to work. Because everybody gets such a scare people didn't even want to go to work yeah. that was the crazy right think about that isn't that nuts yeah no it's it's definitely i mean we could you know we could I mean, you're not a hero because you go to work yeah yeah i mean you're, you're not a hero because you go to work yeah okay i'll be straight up with that one, okay i mean that's that do, that doesn't rate the hero you know i've known heroes and it's not because they show up to work okay. yeah yeah no i mean we, we could talk about that for at length but um let's let's go back to 09 uh where you kind of it sounds like you kind of closed up shop and then and then moved into uh you know where you are now with escape the owner prison and everything so walk us through that and then i do want to touch on on the book in in detail and, and give listeners a, a an idea of what's going on there i'm excited my copy uh you know i just got that in the mail last friday so i'm excited to dive into it um so maybe it's <laughs> maybe i'm just looking for a sneak preview as well I'll give you both, no problem. I love yeah, it. so when, I, when everything collapsed, I really would like, when I said I'm done, I was done. And I, that could be, there's pluses and minuses to my attitude. Okay. I'm kind of when I'm done, I'm done kind of guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally like, I even had video like me burning my, my uniforms I had for the business, right? Wow. I like it was in the bonfire in the backyard, like <laughs> brand new posters. I'm done. I'm never, I mean, I sold all my welding equipment. I'm like, I'm never touching this stuff again. You know, I'm leaving. I'm done. We moved. I had to move. I kind of lost the house. I lost everything. We packed up, changed states. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a little extreme. But then it was like, you know, let's start over. Let's do this. You know, let's, let's, what am I going to do going forward? So 09 was a terrible thing and a great thing all at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, with kids and everything else, I have all these children home who literally like and i'd leave at like 4 35 in the morning if they'd be up they'd be crying holding me you know even little when they were like three and four years old sometimes they, they come out to the truck you know they greet me i mean it was like the coolest thing ever like when i came home i just got attacked by six kids you know they're crawling and whatever you know yeah. changing diapers and doing all that stuff at the same time but but then this stuff hit and i realized kind of after that november 5th thing I'm like, you know, it was a big epiphany. I go, you know what? All this stuff I had, you know, the trucks, the fleets of trucks. I got this, I got that, I got money. I got, I'm like, my kids don't care about any of that stuff, right? All they cared about was, am I home? When am I coming home? Why do I have to leave, right? So I started thinking like, man, all this means nothing. This stuff means nothing to me. 
you know, without these kids, you know, yeah. like who you can't, you, I mean, you can't buy that, right? You can't buy it. I mean, there was times even when I moved, one of my twin boys would run down the street after me as I left, like crying. Wow. I'm like, you know, you're looking at a rear view mirror, like it's the most, like, I'm almost going to cry now. I'm like, I'm like, it's just like, man, what am I doing? I can't, I'm not going to repeat that life again. Richard, I'm not going to work I, I, every hour of every day. Yeah, no, that that's that's painful. That is that is painful. Yeah, and I just and and I know that you know, in the way the world is now, like you know, both parents have to work usually, and all this stuff. You know, we decided that wasn't going to be the case. We're going to homeschool our kids. My wife's going to. She worked at the Chicago Board of Trade until we had our first and. Boom, we had that, and then she hasn't worked since, right? But like, but then my problem was, well, I'll just work more to make up for that. And then we realized what what Owen I did was put everything into perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, from me, like, you know, with the kids, with work, with the time with my family, you know, doing things. Now I wasn't a vacation guy, I would never take vacations, I just work all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, gain success, did all that recognition, that was all good, but it was not a life. I don't know where I'd be if I had kept on that path, probably divorced and who knows why, who knows, you know what I mean? But I wouldn't have the connection with my children for one mm -hmm. that we have because now I could be with them. I can mentor them. I can, you know, influence them in a better way. Otherwise all they would have known was, Oh, you're a dad. You work all the time. That's what you do. Right. It was a cycle. I would have put all my kids through and then your kids, you know, more is caught than taught. That's all they would know going forward, too. So the next generation is going to be what? A giant hot mess. Right? Because all they're going to know is what they learned from me. Like what I learned from my, my parents. You know, my dad worked all the time. It was good. I kind of picked that up. So I wanted to break that cycle. And that's where, you know, ETOP, the Escape the Owner Prison stuff came in. Right? Like, okay, how do I do this? How do I, you know, this is how this is going to work. So when I wanted to write the book, I'm like, okay, what was, you know, I started documenting all the steps. How do you change this? How do you, how can I create this in the business? How can I do this? How can I have this time with my family? How can I not be the guy running materials to a job site? How can I not be the guy doing the accounting? How can I not, all these steps that other people could do, they didn't need me to do as an owner. You know, my thing is being a visionary, right? My thing is driving forward with my business and my and my, uh, my ideas and my growth strategies and everything else, how can I do that yet still have time to be with my family, grow the business I want to have, you know, and just have a peace inside me that isn't concerned about getting the next Friday. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Um, and then you did end up starting another business, right? You know, it, it sounds like you took some time off to, well, some forced time off, if you will, <laughs> Uh, to move and, and do all of that, but uh, right. you did end up starting another business and uh, and getting another one off the ground, I'm assuming, with these new principles in place? Yeah, yeah I sure did. You know, I started, started building that, so I, I opened some gyms. You know, I opened a gym. I, I, I was a big in the fitness, personal training, all that stuff, so I, I also took that. I opened my own boot camp style, you know, uh, fitness you know, fitness gym. So I had that really cool. Even some of the rain course stuff and all my other training I've got. Uh, built that, grew that, was really good. Started doing a roofing company. So I opened a roofing company as well. Got into the industry, which was great as a GC mm -hmm. doing that. And it really built all that. And that was, that was those couple of, those couple of combinations like, okay, I can do this. And then started learning again, to delegate, put this out. How do we get this done? How do I work these hours? And then didn't, putting all those pieces together so I was able to create those businesses and then keep moving forward and again watch my kids grow up give them the time they needed you know spend time with my wife and they just kind of like this is pretty smooth yeah you know but again I had to learn a lot but again documented it and putting it down so that that's how it became okay now, now time to share this you know because now I've done it now I know I can do this and I want to share so what would you you mentioned the word delegate as you were going through there um what, what would you say is the most important thing to kind of escape the owner prison? If you could distill it down into one, one word, delegate is what popped out at me as something that's probably pretty important. Um, but what would you, right. what would you say? I have a thing I call the overhiring principle. Okay. okay? So when I talk about that, it doesn't mean wasteful. It just means that 
you need to understand you need to create margin in your life. Okay, and margin is not just a money thing, it's time, right? How do you how do you capture time? Because time's our most valuable asset, right? So how do you capture that? And that's by sooner than later, okay, and this is the hard part for entrepreneurs to do this earlier than later. Everyone thinks when I make more money, I'll do X, right? It's always about that. I'm gonna do more marketing when I make some money. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna hire another person when I'm but I gotta make a little more. Mm-hmm. You know, that's part of the sacrifice in the early in the early stages is to get people on who can do things for you, whether it's virtual assistants, office managers, uh, you know, project managers, you know, crew foremen. You've got to start getting those people that can handle those tasks. Otherwise, you will never be free. You know, that's probably the most important thing is you got that's got to be like like number one or two on the priority list of your business. So, so when you say about who is going to do these parts, man. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say, you know, that's, that's kind of one of the sacrifices, like I get it from a marketing perspective and we chatted about that on your podcast and, and that's kind of, you know, where I am is marketing and sales are ex- extremely important, but how do you, um, how do you justify hiring someone on if you don't necessarily have the, you know, capital to, to sustain it at the time, uh, but you know, you need that to be able to scale and grow. Because thinking you don't have the capital is a lie you tell yourself. Okay. All right. And I, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but if you look at your life, anything you've wanted, you've got. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you really want something, we always buy things. And now, now I'm here quoting, we can't afford, right? You spend too much on the car payment. Maybe you get the house you really aren't ready to have, but you get it anyways, and you're still making the mortgage payments. So to say you can't afford something is kind of a lie you tell yourself, mm-hmm. right? Because once you get that person, you're going to find a way to pay that person. Gotcha. You know, but also by getting that person frees you up time to make more money in the business because you can focus on other things like generating income. Gotcha. So that's that's a big thing. That's all I'm saying, you know, but it really is. It really is a lie you tell yourself. And again, I've, I'm just giving you 30 years of experience of lying to myself. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, <laughs> no matter what, I always find a way to do it, you know? Yeah, I think that's valid uh, as well. And I, I've seen that, you know, with with the examples of things, I'm, I'm just kind of scrolling back through in my mind's eye of, of that. It's like, you know, when you want to go for something, you just go for it and you figure out how to make it work. Um, you know, that could be a set of coaching, which you do coaching, um, you know, getting your book, doing whatever it is, hiring a new person, right? if it's something that you need to do and want to do, you're going to figure out how it works, right? Yeah. People like, Oh, you're going to write like people told me like, again, growing up, I've, you know, I, like a lot of people, it took, like I was kind of a goof in school and I didn't really care for school and I was never going to be anything. That's what I was told all the time. Right. I had no talent. All right. Well, guess what? Okay. <laughs> I have a lot of talent. Okay, a world recognized artist. I made I made more in one commission than the people tell me I was going to do anything they made in ten years. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like, you know, success is your best revenge. But at the same time, I just did stuff. Yeah. I just started doing it and figured it out. The book is the same thing. I just wrote an outline and then created a book. You know, so I'm like, and then okay, now now what do I got to do? You know, I create a cover. I got to do this, that cover, and you learn a heck of a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, but it was a lot of time standing at my kitchen counter writing. You know, but I knocked the thing out and I got it done. And then now, how do I get to be a bestseller? Okay, figure that. I got I got number one in ten different categories. You know, on Amazon. So that was really cool because I took action. Right. I didn't think about it. It literally took me a month to write the book. Wow. You know, but which wow. to pe- some people is super fast. You know, for me, but I'm a doer. Like I don't, I just don't play. <laughs> I just I literally like get things done. You know, I focus. That's what I remember. I'm a kind of extreme dude. So when I get into the book, it's the book until the book is finished. You right. Know, I right. don't do an hour a day. I'm not good at that. That's, <laughs> that's not my strong point. Mine is you need something done. I get her done. Well, we were talking off air before we hopped on about, you know, both of us starting our podcasts and, and uh, what kind of a, a guiding factor in my life or guiding saying has been imperfect action beats perfect inaction every day. And I mean, I think you are the embodiment of that, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, it, that's what it is, though. And again, 
here's the beauty of experience, okay, in a, a lifetime of doing stuff. You look back and man, you get a big whiteboard and you can just, wow, I did that, I did it that way then, that way this, everything, everything that really became, I became good at or successful at was because I just started, you know, without any, with no planning, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying planning is a bad thing, but let's say minimal planning, all right? Because planning is is cool like it's like you write all the time but you don't do anything you teach but you don't do mm -hmm. you know you, I, i'm a doer so everything i had accomplished was because i just when i wanted the box right i wanted to become a boxer i got out of the marine corps i wanted the box so I'm like, okay well i was working the guy i box is my friend crazy dave we called him took me down okay i want a box so i go down the first day get in the ring with him okay he's a monster all right only use his left hand all right broke my nose hit me with a left hook so hard my mouthpiece flew out of my mouth out of the ring and across the gym okay i couldn't chew for like three days two black eyes everything else and i'm like all right i'll be back tomorrow i'm gonna get good at this you know? <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i got i got the crap beat off you know because i wanted to try it. and guess what i became a golden glove state champion second four state region because every day i trained twice a day and i spent the next few years doing that and i got great at it you know because i you know i just get, get busted up and then get better that's just how it works so, I mean, you're touching on another theme there, which is something that I've been diving into myself. Um, and that is consistency. Um, consistency in, in my life, I've seen the results are come when I put my head down. And, and I've seen other mentors and coaches talk about this and kind of soaked it up from them. But put your head down and don't look at the angle. Just look at putting in the work. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I mean you kind of, you've kind of talked about it right there with the boxing story, but maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, I, it can't be underestimated. Consistency cannot be underestimated. You know, again, I've, I've been inconsistent too. That's how I can make a really good comparison. Right. Because I've, you know, you'll get your little dreams and then you'll kind of start, but you flounder and you don't really stick to it. But again, looking back, everything that I achieved, you know, that, that was worth achieving, right, was a big accomplishment, was consistent practice, consistent attention day in and day out every day and it made a difference you know if i want to cut weight if i want to achieve a certain physical goal in the gym you know it's about tracking it measuring it being consistent so it's it it is truly a the cornerstone of success i would say it's a work in progress for me but yeah no it's uh i mean i, mean, I think it always will be but but putting my head down and, and focusing on the, the daily habits rather than oh i'm not at you know where i want to be in two years i think is so important um, so Richard, you know, I, I'd like to wrap up here with, with you kind of, um, answering the question I spring on guests. And that is what is the one or two things you would leave with a new business owner? Uh, you've kind of run the gamut of different businesses being burnt out, written a book, you're now coaching people, but if you could kind of put it to one or two things that you would tell a, a new business owner that would help steer them in the right direction or mindset things, what would, what would that be? One is really gonna understand what your what your purpose is with your business. That's number one. Really understand what what you do. What's what's the uniqueness of your business and how are you bringing it to people? That's number one. The second one is again going back to what we had talked about is learn to delegate, bring on the right people. You know, search them out. Even if you truly can't hire anyone right now and you're just starting, know what that position needs to be. You need to lay out those positions and then put them in priority, who you want to take, who's first, who's second, who's third, and start looking for those people because you'll get there sooner. If you keep your eye on that, on that goal, you will find a way to get there much quicker. And then you'll watch yourself be able to grow and scale your business and still have a, a life worth living. Wow. That's that. I, I like the way you worded that is even if you don't have, uh, you know, the ability right now to, to figure out that's, that's huge. And I, I mean, truthfully, I'm, I'm kind of in that position right now. So I, I'm taking that to heart, you know, as we speak. So Richard, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, obviously having me on your podcast as well. And I'm excited to chat more in the future and dive into your book. But it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on here today. Well, Lewis, I appreciate you just giving me the time. And uh, yeah, lo love to do it again anytime. But it's, it's been my pleasure. Absolutely. Beautiful. All right, guys. Well, we will wrap up Richard's uh, 
actually if you can you can tell people where they can find you and where they can find your podcast and your book and everything uh just just take a second to do that and i'll put the links in the description cool. as well. Oh yeah, ETOP podcast, E T O P, ETOP for Escape the Owner Prison, ETOP podcast. Get a lot of great stuff. That's probably one of your best places to go. Uh, to of course find me on Facebook and everything else. Richard Walsh on Facebook, you can find that. Um, yeah, we'll keep it that simple. Do that, and it'll take you the rest of the places. Beautiful. All right, Richard. Well, I appreciate you and and everyone who uh, you know found value in this. Please follow Richard. Follow what he's doing. Follow the ETOP podcast and. Uh, leave him a review and and obviously leave our podcast right here a review as well. So we will catch you guys next time.